This is Philosophy Bites with me, David Edmonds. And me, Nigel Warburton. Philosophy Bites is available at www.philosophybites.com. What's ethically okay for Muslims may not be okay for Christians. What's seen as morally acceptable in Manchester may not be all right in Mogadishu. You may think capital punishment or euthanasia are wrong. I may disagree. We're tempted to think that morality is relative, that we can resolve moral disputes as we resolve disputes in other areas. In history, say, we might argue about the date of the Battle of Hastings. In maths, we might challenge a proof. But we think there's a definitive answer to such disagreements. Which raises the question, is the realm of morality different? Are morals relative? The man to answer this question is one of Britain's leading moral philosophers, Professor Simon Blackburn. Simon Blackburn, welcome to Philosophy Bites. Thank you very much. Lovely to talk to you. The topic I wanted to ask you about today is moral relativism. I wonder if you could just sketch for us what you understand by that term. Well, I think moral relativism is a position that uh, intrigues, even if it doesn't attract people. It, of course, starts with the elementary observation that there are different sensibilities. People react differently, morally, to different things. Some people think abortion's permissible, some people think it's not, some people think that assisted euthanasia is permissible, other people think it isn't. Some people think that the will of Allah has to be done, other people don't think it is of any relevance. And so you've got different views, you've got different positions, you've got the potential for conflict, obviously. The question then arises, can we defend the idea of one truth, one single moral truth, in the face of all this diversity? Or is the diversity a sign that there isn't really a single moral truth? Rather, as people think, for example, in matters of taste, there's no perhaps single truth. And relativism is basically the idea that the same is true for morals. In the area of taste, people talk about, it. oh, it's all subjective. Mm. Actually, what you just described sounded like what's often called subjectivism. I wonder, do you see that as a variety of relativism or actually at the core of it? I think it's a variety of it. The subjectivist is a relativist because he will think, as the relativist does, that I can say truly that abortion is permissible, let's say, and you can say truly that it's not, and we each have our own truth. And the subjectivist protects that idea by saying, I'm describing my own reaction. I'm saying of myself that I approve of, say, abortion. And you're saying of yourself that you don't. And then those two remarks are compatible. They could each be true, just as I like toothpaste with a mint flavor and you don't. So relativism would be any theory which encapsulates this idea that there are individual differences which may be culturally given that mean that there is no absolute truth about the matter in any moral judgment that we make. Torturing babies is wrong. That statement is just subjective. It's just a matter of taste. It doesn't have this sort of authority which is objective in any way. That's pretty much it, actually, Nigel. Yes, I think that's a very good thumbnail definition of it. As the example of subjectivism shows, it can then be worked out in various ways. But the core idea has to remain that I've got my truth, you've got your truth, and there's no metaphysical or absolute, as you put it, norm or value knocking about in the universe, which I'm getting right and you're getting wrong, or vice versa. So is it true? Is moral relativism actually an accurate picture of the nature of morality? I argue no, it's not true. The reason it's not true is that it doesn't do justice to the fact of disagreement and conflict. That is, if I think that abortion is right or permissible and you think that it never is, we've got a disagreement, and it's a disagreement which could lead to conflict. In serious cases, moral disagreement can lead to war, obviously. That's not like I like toothpaste and I don't in different mouths where you just say, OK, sure, live and let live, de gustibus non disputandum, all that. Uh, you just can't say that in the moral case. If I think fox hunting with dogs should be banned and you think that it's an admirable part of English country life, then we've got a political disagreement on our hands. The relativist, as it were, doesn't do justice to that because he just says, you've got your truth, I've got mine, end of story. The trouble is it's not the end of the story because we're each seeking to impose a policy on the other. In some cases where there's disagreement, there are facts which, if they become known, resolve the issue. Is that what you're saying morality is like? Well, not quite. My position gets rather complicated here. There are people called, for example, moral realists, 
who think that there must be a fact, either fox hunting is right or it's not right, and it's our job to find out which. And they see that as a kind of almost metaphysical commitment. There's a moral reality, and their problem is making sense of that. I take a more pragmatic view of it. I say, well, look, whether or not there's such a moral reality, and let's just shunt that to one side for the moment, we're going to have disagreement, we're going to have conflict, and we're going to need to know what to do. We're going to perhaps be conflicted in our own minds about things. Should I allow my teenage daughter to do this, that, or the other? I think that's got nothing to do with an attempt to get a moral reality right. Uh, it's got everything to do with an attempt to work out how to live, to work out a plan or a scheme for living. Now, I think it's the same with more serious sort of moral disagreements. So the practical importance of thinking about ethics, I think I would defend on pragmatic grounds, not on the grounds that we're attempting to describe a moral reality, which is a rather mysterious kind of ontological denizen of the universe. A moral relativist would probably say that female circumcision is okay for certain cultural groups, it's right for them, it's wrong for us. That doesn't give any hint of how you might resolve a conflict between those two different groups. I'm really interested to know how you'd apply this pragmatic approach faced with a cultural relativist like that. Well, of course, often the kind of remark you just cited is a sort of plea for live and let live or toleration or possibly even an injunction that we have no right to interfere, we mustn't interfere, there's something wrong about imposing our will on other people. I think that's uh, only partially true. It's sometimes true. Um, in some cases, I'm not sure it's true at all. For example, the female circumcision case, where I think it's quite legitimate for people to feel that the treatment is so degrading and so misogynistic in various ways and does such damage to people that we do become very uncomfortable about just standing aside and letting it happen. There's a famous knockdown argument against the kind of moral relativism that we've been discussing, which is that most moral relativists believe absolutely that relativism is true, so they're inconsistent in some ways. They both believe that every judgment is relative, but the judgment, every judgment is relative, is itself absolutely true, so not relative. Right. Yes, that's a very good old argument. It's the so-called peritrope of Plato. It happens in the Theotetus. I think it's a doubtful argument myself. It's too quick. And the obvious response to it is for the relativist to say, look, I don't put forward, for example, non-toleration or even my own relativism as an absolute position. Um, I don't believe in absolute positions. I've just told you I think everything is relative. So I'm quite happy to admit that status for my own position. That means it's no better or worse than other things but then you have to take it as it appears to you. And my persuasive ambition is to persuade you that the right way to think about it is that everything's relative. So how would you characterise your own position? What name is it usually known by? It's an unlovely title that I've been, well, I landed myself with, but it has stuck. I'm called a quasi-realist. And what that suggests is that without going metaphysical, as I say, I don't believe in starting with the idea of a moral reality. That does nothing for me. Nevertheless, I think that talking in terms of disagreement, in terms of attempts to find solutions, attempts to come to one mind, worries about how I'm to live my life, all those are genuine worries and genuine phenomena. And the relativist is really trying to undermine something in our practices and I want to defend our practices. I want to defend, for example, the seriousness with which we take moral disagreement and try to resolve it. So it's as if you've got a moral reality, which is uh, our job to find, although that picture is, I think, only a picture. If you take the example of multiculturalism, which is a major question in Britain, whether it is the correct way to approach different ethnic backgrounds within Britain, some people argue that... Toleration has gone too far. Actually, what we've been doing is tolerate many intolerant people with a, with a devastating result. And I just wonder if your approach would have anything to say about multiculturalism, whether there's some sort of angle that it would logically give us on that. 
I don't think it directly speaks to it, but what my approach would do would be it, it would be very hospitable to the possibility that we've gone too far. Do we allow people complete license in ways of behavior or of modes of speech, or do we clamp down? Obviously, the pendulum can swing and go too far in either direction, and or equally, obviously, it's a complicated matter of political judgment whether at any particular time we've gone too far one way, too far the other. And do you think philosophers have got anything that they can particularly add to that debate? Or are we just commenting on the sidelines like sports commentators? I'm afraid I do rather tend to the second view. Although I believe wholeheartedly in the practice of moral debate, and I think they're very serious questions we have to tackle, like, for example, the limits of toleration... I'm rather sceptical about the existence of expertise or expertise across the board. I think there are things philosophers can bring to these debates, the traditional virtues of clarity and care, knowing when it's an empirical problem, knowing when it's a moral disagreement and things like that. But I think the idea of moral expertise, I do jib at. I'm not sure about that. And certainly if you come to the philosopher for solutions in any moderately complicated political arena, I think you'll just find you've got a dozen philosophers and 13 solutions, as they say about economists. And I think that's a result of the fact that fundamentally morality is a deep expression of personality and of plans for living, plans for the body politic that we admire, and people will differ. So you go back to the relativist starting point, people will differ. You've described yourself as a quasi-realist and said that these debates about moral issues are real debates at some level, but there's no objective truth about how they should be resolved. Is there something about your approach that explains why these moral disagreements actually are genuine disagreements? Well, at one level, that's quite easy. I mean, let's take a non-moral case. Suppose uh, we have to decide where to go on holiday and you say you want to go to the mountains and I say, no, I want to go to the seaside. Then we've got a disagreement, and it's a real disagreement, assuming we can only go to one, and we have to either bargain or negotiate or work through it and give each other reasons for preferring the one to the other. And, of course, you know, eventually it could lead to whatever it is, divorce or whatever. So disagreement, I think, is the name of the game very often. Similarly, if I want people to go on fox hunting and you want them not to, then just at the level of desire we've got a disagreement and you could be expected to act to prevent them and I act to promote it and we've got uh, policies which are in conflict and we might come to blows, as people do. So disagreement, I don't think, is too problematic. And if you see the relativist as trying to somehow wish it away, then the position, I think, does begin to look very, well, in a sense, silly, impractical. Suppose I say fox hunting yay and you say fox hunting no, and in comes Rosie the relativist, and she says, hey, you two, Why don't you just realise that fox hunting is good for Nigel and bad for Simon, and that's the end of it? Another question I want to ask is, how does that help? Whatever led me to oppose fox hunting is still presumably there. Whatever led you to admire it or wish to tolerate it is still there. The idea that we're not in conflict just starts to look farcical, and the conflict has not been resolved by Rosie. It hasn't even been helped. Simon Blackburn, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And you can hear more Philosophy Bites at www.philosophybites.com. Mm-hmm.